that is being implemented by ICANN. And this project is quite special because it enables the introduction of IDN variants into the root zone, which essentially enables people to have access to IDN top-level domains. And so what we will do is basically share information about the project, tell you why ICANN has this project, um, what the procedure is for enabling the introduction of IDN variants into the root zone, um, what is the status of the project, and then we will invite comments from community representatives on what they think about this project and how it will affect the language communities around the world, and we will also get an idea of what the variants are for Arabic, for the Han script, which implicates Chinese language, Korean, and Japanese, as well as Devanagari from India. So what we'll do is we'll start with an introduction of the project uh, by Ram Mohan, who is chair of the ICANN board, IDN Variants Working Group, who is also executive vice president and chief technology officer of Affilias Limited, and he is particip participating remotely. Ram, if you are online, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. <coughs> okay, so Ronalia, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to, to this um, uh, session. It's, uh, 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 both the, this session has importance both in terms of the, the sense of what we're trying to do, but also the relevance of what we're trying to do. Um, when only 27% of the world speaks English, which uses ASCII as its underlying script, it seems obvious that the DNS needed to move to support local languages and scripts. Certainly, to ICANN and the ICANN community, the need to add linguistic diversity to the root of the Internet was established quite clearly. <clears throat> but as with all things technical, it has taken us just over a decade in order to achieve an overnight success in having IDNs, international domain names, at the uh, delegated at the top level um, of the root system. Let's speak for a minute about the strategic intent of the root zone label generation rules project. Now, before we get into uh, speaking about label generation rules, just a quick uh, idea of what, why we're really trying to do label generations at the root. The fact is that for each language, it is represented under, not underneath it by a script, by a written form that is then converted into a digital way that is that the DNS and resolvers can, can understand and, and interpret. What was clear was that at the root zone, which is a very unique resource, we needed to have a list that clearly represented for each of the languages that we wanted to have on the root to have what were the rules and what would be representations uh, in a digital format of these characters that form the language. The IDN variant TLD project was, issued, was established by the ICANN board in 2010. And what this project allowed was the creation of a multi-stakeholder project that, allow, that was tasked to develop solutions and to implement, define as well as implement rules and processes uh, to, so that we could have the delegation of IDN variant top level domains in the root zone. Now, the multi stakeholder model has been a very key part of the creation and the development uh, and the deployment of the root zone label generation rules procedure. Now, as, as you know, ICANN, in general, works pretty hard on deploying the solutions, identifying solutions as well as deploying them by using a community-oriented multi-stakeholder model. The IDN 
TLD program and the variant part, the ID invariant TLD program, is quite a good case study in the de development and the deployment of a multi stakeholder model and a multi stakeholder system. To start with, uh, out of various languages and scripts, uh, script systems that were uh, selected for study, analysis, and creation of of uh, the uh, tables, language tables, and language rules, this pulled in 66 experts from 29 countries and territories around the world with expertise in the areas of DNA, at DNS. IDNA, linguistics, security and stability, as well as policy, operations from a registry and what we call perspective, and to some extent perspective from the end user uh, and the internet user's point of view. ICANN also created an issues report that looked at the risks and looked at the methodologies for ruling out uh, top-level domains using IDNs that have variants associated with them. Uh, and that too brought together representatives from the various case study teams who were volunteers and who were members who, um, uh, from all around the world, from various communities. In addition to to the participation uh, that was uh, that came together by technical and linguistic experts and security experts from around the world, the community at large has also been directly engaged. The uh, the at large advisory committee has organized several uh, extremely useful and well attended workshops um, on the, on the topic of IDN top level domains. ID, the usage of top of the domains using like worms, the the, uh, the deployment of variants using uh, at the IDN top level, uh, and in addition to that, there have been webinars, public comment periods, consultation periods, and conference presentations and discussions, um, and all of this has happened not only inside of the ICANN context but also in other multi-stakeholder fora, such as the ITF. So, in conclusion, the, the, this entire project is of strategic intent for ICANN and the ICANN community, but most importantly, it's of urgent need for the world's multilingual community not deploying IDNs at the top level has for years been a key criticism of the mono-oral or the monolingual uh, model of the DNS. And for the first time in a long time, we're moving in a historic way from having only ASCII and only uh, English or the Romance language represented at the top level were moving to have local languages also represented at the top level. Now, technically, keep in mind the DNS only knows ASCII, so even the local languages eventually, for computers, they get translated into an ASCII equivalent uh, into a special code called Unicode. But that's a technical detail. When it comes to the end user, when for the first time we're looking at the ability to type in an entire website address in local language to send an email that is written completely in your own local language, whether it is a left to right language or a right to left language. And that is historic and that is uh, also something that has been built with the multi-stakeholder model at the core of it. Back to you, Renaldia. Thank you, Ram. That was very valuable. I think Fadi's aunt will be even more happy that she could type um, a domain name all the way in Arabic and also be able to use variants if this project is successful. So now, to understand what the procedure is, this famous procedure, 
Um, I invite Andrew Sullivan, Principal Architect of DIN, to, to share um, the procedure with us. And he's here not because he's with DIN, but because he's one of the lead consultants that helped develop this procedure itself. And so if you do not like it, you can tell him so. Go ahead. That's right. It's all my fault. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I'm going to go very quickly here at the beginning to just uh, give some reminder of, of the context of this before we, uh, we go on. So to, to begin with, remember, the DNS is a tree structure, uh, and it's got all these different um, levels, and was developed a number of years ago, in fact, in the 1980s, but it's totally fundamental to the way everything works on the Internet. You basically can't do stuff without it. So if you don't have uh, the DNS, you're out of luck, and this is the reason why people wanted um, uh, labels other than simply ASCII in there. Next. So now remember, uh, names are in the DNS. They are, they're made up of these little segments. They're called labels, next. Um, and these labels, uh, uh, whether it's uh, way to the left or next, next, um, even the rightmost one, they're just labels. They're all the same kind of thing. Uh, so there's nothing special about any particular label. And this is uh, important uh, to understand. The, 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 the piece of the domain name is not particularly important. It turns out, of course, that there is a practical consequence. There are technical consequences at the top level because of the way the top level uh, is used. And the reason for that is that it's got this common root. Next, please. So in the DNS, we have these things, delegations. And delegation can happen anywhere. Uh, what happens is you take part of the namespace and you give it to someone else. Next, please. Uh, this can happen you know, anywhere in the tree, including, next, please, uh, even far down in the tree. So this is an important other thing. That is, you give away chunks of the namespace, and you don't have any control uh, inside the, the space that you've just given away. Another fundamental point. So finally, next, please. Uh, we've got this one root, and this is one root by definition. When people talk about alternate roots, they're making a complaint about math. Um, that's, this is just a fact of, uh, of, of directed uh, graphs. And so there's this one root. And that means that this is a completely unique zone on the internet. And that's the key thing here, that we have to have one common uh, set of rules for this zone because everybody in the world has to share it whether they like it or not. So that's the reason that we need this. All right. So we came up with this idea about the label generation rules. Next, please. Um, and uh, what this is, is we, we start with some fundamental things. Yes? You want me slower. All right. Um, so we've come up with the uh, label generation rules and we're starting with uh, the the basic facts of, of the DNS. So the first thing is DNS names are not words, they're mnemonics. Uh, they're, they're useful things, but of course mnemonics have to be useful to someone, which means that for you to be able to use them, you need to be familiar, uh, it needs to be a familiar and recognized writing system. And naturally, if you don't use ASCII in your everyday life, then of course those letters are not very useful for you, and that's the reason why we needed to do this. We have to remember that the existing rules for the DNS already restrict some labels. So in the DNS, historically, you weren't allowed to use the word can't with an apostrophe. You can't put the word arg in there with an exclamation mark. You can't do those things because they're not words. So there's just a bunch of mnemonics there, and that's what it is. Um, so we've got new kinds of labels. These are the IDNA labels. And the IDNA labels, because it's a new kind of label, that means you need more rules. That's the reason that we need these rules. Next, please. Now, another important thing to understand is that these label generation rules work on code points. So there's more than one thing that you could have done here, but the way that this actually works just technically is it works on code points. Now, code points are uh, a, a little bit of technology. So normally you think you're writing in characters or you think you're writing in words, but when you encode this in a machine, you've got to encode it in a character set. And the character set that we're using is called Unicode, and Unicode is made up of code points, and these code points have funny names like this. So you can see this, U plus 0065, that's a code point, and that corresponds to an E, and uh, U plus 036C8, uh, sorry, is the Greek small letter psi. So, so these are just code points, and every code, every letter that you can write has one or more code points. Uh, there can be multiples. Next. So, I just said there can be multiples. Isn't this fun? There is this problem that when you have more than one code point, and it can be one co uh, more than one code point that you, as a, as a reader, a competent reader, cannot tell the difference between one and the other, or it can be 
more than one code point where as a competent reader you can see the difference but you think they're the same thing. One way or the other, you've got in some writing system a case where different code points can sometimes be interchanged one to the other. They can be exchanged. Uh, so one example is simplified in traditional Chinese, but there are other examples. There's lots of other examples. What we want to do in this procedure is prevent allocation of any label to competing applicants. And this is any label in the root zone, of course. This is only for the root zone. We're not making rules about further down the tree because that's just been delegated away. And uh, we also want to allow the possibility of some variants, uh, uh, some idea variants that match one another and that are going to be used by people, uh, always to go to the same original applicant. So you want both of these, uh, both of these features. And that's really what the label generation rules are about. They define these variants and their possible distributions. In order to do that, you've got to have the list of all the code points. Next. So, we developed a list of the allowable code points. This is the so-called repertoire. Uh, we developed rules for using this repertoire. And the point of this is not to have uh, a bunch of rules for whatever people want right now. You don't want, you know, ad hoc rules that are subject to political um, discussion every time. What you want instead is a rule set that allows you to accommodate the future developments. You're going to minimize the risk to the root zone. And you want to make sure that these rules are automatic so that when something new comes along because new characters get added to Unicode from time to time, you want to make sure that they can be accommodated in the system too. Next, please. Now, it turns out that the Internet Architecture Board had a view about uh, what you should do in this case. And the reason for this is that the Internet Architecture Board previously had something to say about how the top level ought to be, um, ought to be managed. And prior to that, there were some very old documents that said something about what should be in the root zone. So if we were going to expand it, since this is something that everybody on the internet has to use all the time, we needed some guidance about how to do that. And the Internet Architecture Board uh, came together and, and came up with a bunch of uh, principles, and you can see the principles are named there. Oh no, they're named over there uh, on the uh, uh, on the slide. But the key one, and the thing that is most important here to, to take away, is that conservatism was the number one leading principle to stick to here. So when you ran into any kind of case where you weren't sure how it was going to work or whether it was going to work all the time or whether it was going to be useful all the time, then the best thing to do was not to do that, not to use that code point, not to use that label, because everybody in the world has to share this, this resource. Uh, so it's one thing to say way down in your local zone, you know, have all kinds of crazy labels you want, but if you're going to have something that everybody in the world has to share, what you have to do is, is, is use the minimum thing that you can put in there while nevertheless accommodating people so they can use labels according to familiar writing systems. You know, they, can, they can actually use them. Next, please. Um, so there's a flow chart here that, um, that gives you a picture of uh, what the IDN root zone, how it, how it works, this, this label generation rules procedure. Um, the, the basic thing is that you've got generation panels and they come up with, you know, proposals. Then you've got this integration panel and the integration panel is supposed to be sort of universal world experts who are supposed to, you know, achieve agreement uh, among these competing proposals. So the proposals are not really supposed to compete with one another, but from time to time you're going to get cases where different um, uh, language communities either use the same letters or use letters that sort of bump up against one another. Uh, and in that case, you're, you need to make sure, you don't need to, to decide one in favor of the other. What you need to do instead is coordinate to make sure that nobody's ox is getting bored too much. Um, right? We want to make sure that all the oxes wander around happily. Um, and and that, that sometimes means, you know, you say no to, uh, to people, but the reason you have to do that is because, um, you know, this is a common resource and we've got to share it. Uh, and then at the end of this, you, you spit out this label generation rules, and it, it defines these, uh, these things that are there on the slide. Next, please. Um, okay, why do we have only one set of rules? As I said repeatedly, but I, I'm going to hammer you all with this because it, it's been uh, one of the things people keep complaining about. Um, uh, it's only one zone, and it's a common zone. We can't get away from it. Everybody has to have it. And therefore, we need one set of rules, and we need only one set of rules for the entire zone in case there are collisions. 
Uh, the generation panels uh, are volunteers and they're, they're supposed to get together. This is supposed to be very much a bottom-up process. The goal of this is really to represent community interests and also to make sure that we've got particular writing system expertise. So these, these panels can call on any experts they want, you can invite these ex outside experts and so on, and that will work. Next, please. Uh, the integration panel is supposed to be uh, really serious experts in the various technologies that are, uh, that are being used here. So DNS, IDNA, Unicode, linguistics. Uh, and we're supposed to, they're supposed to accept these generation panel proposals and then they're supposed to uh, put them together and finally come up with a, um, a, a common set of rules. And importantly, um, they're supposed to make decisions unanimously, so they're not allowed to make decisions I know I'm running out of time. Um, uh, but I'm not going too fast, exactly. Um, finally, you've got, this, uh, you've got this output, and this is the overall repertoire for the root. It's divided into sub-repertoires by script, and then you've got these labels, and they're, uh, they're constrained to be wholly within a sub-tagged um, uh, repertoire. So the whole point is that you've got these things that somehow get a linguistic piece with it. I didn't write these slides, by the way, I have to tell you, so I would have been shorter. Um, uh, finally, and this really is the last thing I have to say, um, only some labels, some uh, writing systems have uh, variants. Uh, and variants are defined globally and not by sub-repertoire. So despite the fact that the, the repertoire says, oh, well, everything in this label has to be in the same set of uh, the same writing system, variants actually cut across the entire set. Uh, and this is all in a machine-readable pr uh, format, so it can be processed automatically. I'm sorry I went over. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, ICANN has actually started the implementation of this project. Um, and Akram Atavla is here to tell us what the status is. And he is the president of ICANN's generic domains division, which oversees the, the team at ICANN that actually coordinates the implementation of this project. Thank you. Um, well, thank you all for uh, coming here and listening to this important topic. Um, uh, I have a lot of opinions on this, uh, but I'll leave it to the end. Uh, the uh, integration, uh, the implementation of this uh, procedure uh, is actually well underway. Uh, we have actually started with uh, the integration panel, uh, which has been launched and uh, met already earlier uh, in October. Uh, they are working on setting up the repertoire or the bigger set of what uh, the SGR uh, uh, set could be. Uh, they are also uh, putting their arm, uh, you know, putting their arms about the, around the maximum set. They are uh, uh, looking at the label evaluation rules so that everybody can do the same, follow the same procedures. They are also uh, looking at the format for submitting SGRs to the integration panel. So. So they're doing the guidelines for how the uh, uh, generation panels will interact with the integration panel. Um, on the generation panels, there was a call for uh, uh, generation panels to be formed. Uh, we received statements of interest already from different scripts. Uh, once, these, uh, once a script or a group of people get around the script and uh, decide to form a panel, that panel will be seated and uh, immediately after that they can start their work. So we're expecting the first panel to be uh, launched before the end of the year. Now that depends on the, you know, how quickly the, the community can organize itself uh, around the scripts that it wants and uh, that it wants to develop. Uh, today we have uh, uh, a lot of scripts implemented in the DNS. Uh, we have nine scripts that are included in the new GTLD applications, and there are already another eight that are included in the CCTLD uh, uh, IDNs. Uh, so uh, we expect that generation panels will be formed to address all of these, and there is no uh, reason why we can't also implement uh, additional generation pa uh, panels if uh, other scripts would like to start that work earlier. Um, I, I want to say that we're behind. 
there is no question about that. Uh, ideally, all of this work should have happened before the DNS was started, so that it would have been designed with all of the scripts in mind, uh, so that the rules that are set are t took into account all of the different scripts. But we are where we are, and I think this is very important work, and we're just scratching the surface. We talk about uh, doing this work for only the root, but I think once this work is done, then a lot of, there will be a lot of implementation for this work. I think a lot of the TLDs will take that and adopt these uh, uh, these SGRs for their, you know, second level and third level. I think there is uh, uh, a lot of implementation uh, where. Once we set the rules for variance, these variance rules will also apply down, downstream. So there is, this work is just the beginning of a lot of uh, advantages for other scripts than uh, the Latin script. And I'm looking forward to actually seeing more progress on this. Uh, and hopefully we can uh, uh, take advantage of these rules to start thinking uh, in a lot of different areas with the multiple script mentality. And I give an example. There is a lot of RPMs in the TMCH, for example. These RPMs are thought of just in ASCII. Uh, so uh, RPM stands for uh, Rights Protection Mechanisms for uh, tradema uh, Trademark Holders. So when you think about these mechanisms and they, the way they're developed, they're developed by a mentality and a thought of English or, or, or Latin script. If once we get the, the same applications or of TLDs in ITN that go into the TMCH, they'll be at disadvantage because nobody's thinking in those different scripts what are the variations that should be protected, for example, for a, for, a, for a trademark. So just start from there, you can see how we're so far behind and we need to catch up. So uh, thank you very much and uh, I could be happy to take questions later. Thank you, Akram. What I'd like to do now is invite comments from three representatives from end-user communities. They represent the language communities uh, um, of Arabic, Chinese, and um, Indic script. And uh, we have Mohammed El Bashir, who is participating from Qatar. He's the manager, technical affairs department of ICT Qatar, and he has uh, some slides. He was supposed to be here. Unfortunately, um, there was a DNS attack on uh, his registry and he had to be in Qatar to take care of it. Therefore, he's participating remotely with us today. Do you have a slide here? Yeah. Is he online? He's not online. Okay, so he's not online right now. Okay. DNS attacked and intervened and took him away. So we'll just go to the next person then, Hong Xue. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Hong Xue, a law professor from Beijing Normal University. But time goes very fast. I do remember 13 years ago in 2000, when the word number one, uh, word first, language-based IDN uh, consultant uh, a consortium was established in Beijing. Uh, I was one of the drafters of the charter, along with Professor Wu, uh, who is sitting over there across the table. Well, so CDNC is the first community-based, uh, language community-based uh, IDN uh, process to deal with the variants and the other IDN relevant technical issues. I guess it's a very good community-based initiative and in 2000, ICANN established the first uh, board IDN working group chaired uh, by Mr. Kato Masanabu. Uh, CNIC at that time made the first submission to ICANN board to this working group and made the first policy proposal on IDN TLD management. Um, uh, I was the pen holder of this first submission, but the idea uh, primarily came from Madam Hu Chin-Hung who is the president of the Indian Society of China and has been accredited to the, uh, the Hall of Fame by ISOC this year. And we propose that for IDN variance management, it should be uh, absolutely based on language communities' proposal and wishes. And uh, we propose some rough policy issues 
such as for IDN uh, TLDs, uh, I can wish go to the easier part first. Uh, think about IDN SysTLD first before delegate IDN GTLD. It says after 13 years, or our proposal has become a reality. I was so happy yesterday. The first group of uh, Chinese IDN TLD uh, has gone alive. So this is a very much positive achievement. Um, I'd like to go to a few principles that's been uh, experienced by Chinese community, even though we're not very good at summarizing these principles, but has been uh, enshrined in practices. One is community-based. It must be based on the language community. Language community is the concept first raised by Chinese language community in that first submission to ICANN. And I hope I can do re retain these historical uh, documents on a rate, and we could refresh our institutional memory. <laughs> like it, it seems it can, can be found anywhere in ICANN website. Um, language community is open concept. It is not defined by any sovereignty. This is ridiculous to claim language sovereignty. As far as you speak that language, you, you are in that community. So we, we are often uh, joking that uh, there is a bigger English-speaking community in China uh, than the United States. So as far as you speak that language, you need that language community. And secondly, it should be a bottom-up process. Think about the CDNC, Chinese Domain Name Consortium. It was initiated by CNA. It's a technical community. It's not by government. And thirdly, it should be multi-stakeholder. Uh, CDNC is a very interesting organization. Professor Wu and I were the founders, <laughs> among the founders. Uh, we are now only observers. Uh, it is multi-stakeholder, we're still there, but we are now observers from civil society. It is now uh, only open for the full membership for registries, uh, uh, primarily CCTLD registries. That's interesting, but we can, we can still call it a multi-stakeholder organization. And, and also, the last but not least, it should be consensus made. I, I know from the question uh, from the moderator is how to deal with disputes. Uh, I, I strongly dislike this resolution, even though I'm a lawyer. I do believe for this community-based uh, process, it should consensus based. It should find a common denominator accepted uh, most widely in the community. Even the code point per uh, permissible in this DNS system, especially at the root level, it, it should be really acceptable to that community because it's the user in that community is really going to use those codes. Thanks. Thank you, Hong. And I think later in uh, Edmund's presentation, he will give the example or case study about how the Chinese language and the Han script community came together to resolve their differences. They did manage to do that. So next I'd like to invite Satish Babu. Thank you, Amelia. Uh, I am Steve Babu from the National Center for Clear Consensus and Software in India. Uh, I have to be speaking from the perspective of uh, the user, especially from South Asia. Uh, for the technology aspects, we have very senior uh, people from the government and the technology side of things from India. So I'll steer clear of the technology aspects. Uh, now first of all, I'd like to say that uh, IDN is actually a very important component of multilingualism, which in turn uh, reaffirms the, the principles of universal access and diversity that we've been talking about since yesterday. As far as India is concerned, uh, we have uh, a lot of complexity with about 22 languages, uh, with about uh, 19 of them using 11 scripts. So you can imagine the overlap there of uh, like 11 are Brahmic scripts and 3 are the uh, Persian Arabic scripts. Uh, we have problems of one to many and many to one wherein we have some languages using multiple scripts. We have some scripts being used by several languages. The Ibnagri, for example, is used by about uh, nine uh, different languages. Now, these actually uh, kind of pose several complexities. But in, in addition, we also have uh, issues with things like uh, rendering, uh, with uh, multi-tier uh, clips, baseline shifting, homographs and homophones. Uh, but fortunately, we don't have the issue of case variants. We don't have lower number cases. Uh, uh, but we also have issues like, uh, which are pretty uh, kind of unique to Indic uh, languages like Euro with Chinese and non and so on. Uh, plus, some languages do not have all the letters. So, transliteration sometimes is uh, difficult. 
and in one language which is actually not from India, but uh, the Urdu language also uses the same script, the Nasik script, which has a kind of, it is vertical, it goes up as you write, it's a very beautiful kind of representation. And just last week we were reading that uh, that script is dying out because computers are not able to support that particular script. And the community is actually uh, really concerned about the loss of the legacy. So we have, uh, you know, uh, several issues of both encoding and rendering, uh, which are because of the fact that we have these three languages. Now, uh, now as far as the procedure is concerned, we have some uh, general comments. The first comment is to do with the uh, fact that the, the mechanism specified by the procedure uh, for the oversight of the whole procedure process is the public comment. Now, we are aware that public comments, because it's a kind of uh, multi-stakeholder organization, that is the only way that we can go. However, uh, we would like to uh, highlight the fact that there are some weaknesses of this model as well. Uh, for example, can we uh, ensure that the participation of all relevant stakeholders is effective? Uh, you know, all the logistics and mechanics of this uh, procedure. So, uh, I'd like to flag this issue as one that requires uh, perhaps a little more work to ensure that there is transparent representative uh, activity or action that goes on in this public comment process. The other issue is that uh, there is a lot of interest in India from uh, on uh, this issue of uh, uh, the, the ID and internationalism in India. Uh, there is a, uh, as you can see, as uh, has been mentioned already, uh, we are quite active in terms of the already GTLD uh, represented right now and also delegated Devnagari and uh, Tamil uh, have already been delegated. Uh, now, in the issue of uh, the panel, the, the problem is that the, uh, the, the fragmented uh, kind of language communities in India as it's very different from what Hong mentioned in terms of uh, Chinese, for example, which is fairly homogeneous, uniform kind of uh, community. How are we going to ensure that uh, communities are aware of these processes and how do we, what is the facilitation mechanism that we have at hand to ensure that the participation of all these communities is ensured. That uh, I think uh, is something that we have to, uh, we are not clear, we are sitting in India, in, in fact a corner of the, uh, in, uh, the country, we do not see a process of facilitation that exists for smaller language communities. In the larger, like Devanagari, Hindi and all, I am not very sure, but all the communities that there is an issue that there is not really, the process is not transparent, visible and uh, participatory as of now. Uh, so I would like to flag that as also an issue of concern that uh, in, a, in, a, in a very, very diverse country like India that one has to uh, take care of. Thank you very much. Thank you, Satish. Um, after this, we would like to get the presentations from the expert panel and I would like you to get ready. You are starting first, you want to come here and present and while he's setting up, do you have a response, Akram, in terms of what is ICANN doing to facilitate language communities, especially the smaller ones, how are they getting to know about the project, and are we doing anything about the weaknesses of the public comments? Uh, so yes, ICANN is uh, looking into uh, the public comment process, uh, ICANN as in the community. Uh, we've uh, done multiple uh, reviews on that and continue to improve the process. Um, we would like to see the public comment in uh, multiple languages, but uh, right now the majority of the public comments that we get are actually in, uh, uh, in, the, in English and we haven't seen a lot of demand for uh, other scripts in, in the public, uh, public comment. Nonetheless, an area that we are uh, more than willing to investigate and look into. Uh, today, as I mentioned, on the, uh, on the LGR, there are about uh, 17 uh, panels that we are expecting to be working on different scripts. Uh, we uh, don't have any uh, outreach programs right now uh, other than the grassroots outreach programs that uh, you guys are doing to reach out to other communities and see if there is anybody interested. But we are more than willing to participate and help if there are any communities that want to do a uh, to form a panel on a script that's not uh, uh, that hasn't been mentioned. So uh, please.
please let us know and if you need any help we'll figure out a way to help you. Thank you, Alfred. Ram would like to make a comment. Go ahead, Ram. Thank you very much. To the previous panelist's comment on representation for uh, smaller communities and languages, uh, I guess my perspective is that the need and the interest um, has to be reflected uh, from the community into uh, the process. As Akram said, the process is quite open for uh, fulfilling these needs. But I think a quite a bit of the initial startup effort uh, rightly belongs in the local language community. So if you look at, for example, the NASA script, I think it would be important to get together and define what needs to be done to represent it uh, in the DNS and then to come into the process because the process is welcome, welcoming and embracing of um, all the various languages on the representations, um, you know, on the DNS, so long as you can get to unique representations. Thank you, Ram. Are you ready now, Sarmat? Okay. So, Sarmat Hussain is going to make a presentation about the Arabic community and the work that they're doing and to give you some idea of the variance in Arabic. Uh, he is Professor of Computer Science and Head of the Center of Language Engineering, University of Engineering Technology, Pakistan. Okay, thank you, Nadia. I'll just uh, give an overview of what's, uh, uh, what is the latest progress as far as ideals and variants are concerned for Arabic script. Just to start with a little bit of history, uh, the community work for Arabic script actually started a long time ago back in 2002. Uh, but uh, the more recent uh, work uh, started again uh, when the ideal RFCs were revised uh, in 2008. The Arabic script community uh, came together again and formulated a group uh, to look at uh, uh, the relevant issues related to Arabic script, uh, internationalized domain names. Uh, it was a uh, self-formed group by the name of uh, ASFIC, Arabic script IDN working group. Uh, the group worked for a couple of years. Uh, it had participation from multiple countries, uh, multiple languages. Uh, and were able to come together and do the relevant homework, uh, which, as I will share later, was then taken up by other initiatives later in the stream. Uh, in around 2009, uh, um, the fast track process was started, and uh, many of the communities, uh, countries, uh, which were uh, using, which are using Arabic script. Uh, actually uh, used the fast track process to apply for uh, their local uh, strings, uh, strings in Arabic script. Uh, the, the initial homework which was done by ASFIC was eventually uh, uh, used by these communities to develop language tables. Uh, they were called language tables at that time. Uh, they were called language articles in uh, And they were submitted to I can along with the applications uh, and many of those uh, obviously CCTLDs have been, all of those CCTLDs have been approved and many of them are now dedicated and working. So uh, uh, later on uh, there was a start of Arabic uh, Variant Issues Project, uh, Arabic, uh, sorry, uh, generally Variant Issues Project and Arabic was one of the languages which was selected as a case study. Uh, there was a team formulated. Uh, in 2011, which worked and uh, in 2010 and delivered a report on uh, uh, Arabic uh, uh, issues with Arabic uh, script as far as uh, variants was concerned. This work was actually in continuation with what the, uh, the initial work which was started by ASWIC. Uh, further, 
now once the issues were identified they were the community also contributed to the user experience study done by the variant issues project and currently uh, it is now coming together it has actually come together again as a task force on ethics script ideas i'll talk actually a little more about it towards the end of this presentation um, so um, i think one of the things uh, which uh, i'm trying to present here is that the ethics script community actually has been very active uh, uh, for many many years now uh, it has done a lot of homework and it's uh, actually now very ready to actually go to the next step and develop the LGR and then start getting the variants. Okay, uh, just to give an overview, I'm not going to get into details of this. This is all documented in reports uh, elsewhere, but uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, variety of uh, variants which Arabic script has. Uh, there's three large uh, high level categories uh, you can you can have characters which are duplicately coded but have exactly the same shape uh, they have some characters have shape in all contexts same shape in all contexts some have same shape in certain contexts and then uh, there are also characters which have similar shapes not same shapes but they still confusing for user communities and then there are these third kind of characters which are totally different in shape but the user communities consider them as the same so uh, there are all these different kind of variants which exist and which needs to be tackled with as far as generation of the language generation of the is concerned for um, so there is obviously a need uh, for this so you see Pakistan written there uh, even though it looks exactly the same way it has internally a different set of code points so these two things will look the same to the user but will need to be will the current system would consider them as different strings which should not be considered these should not be considered as different strings so some mechanism with through variants should obviously need to be introduced to map these on each other uh, there are about 120 such cases in Arabic script so far which have been identified for further discussion and they need to be uh, eventually uh, eventually worked out for uh, by the community uh, and then all the variants which are generated uh, they need to be eventually uh, some of them at least need to be advocated because uh, different user communities use different keyboards uh, and so some people will be for example typing 0643 and some people will be typing 0689 so you cannot allocate one and block the other and so on um, uh, and then there is real need so out of the 16 ID and CCTLD applications uh, in, uh, with ICANN right now uh, 4 have applicant, applicant uh, 4 have requested for variants so that's like 25% uh, so variants are needed uh, though they are needed uh, they also pose some challenges which need to be uh, obviously addressed. Again, there are multiple layers of these challenges uh, uh, within uh, within the processes, within the tools, within the user applications. Uh, obviously, for example, one of the key things is the string may have more than 500, 600 variants. So, how do you decide which variants to activate and which variants not to activate? So, some of those challenges obviously need to be met eventually. Um, so, let me now come to the last part of my presentation which is focused on what's, what are we doing now uh, so as I said uh, based on the history uh, there has been homework uh, done but that homework now needs to conclude into what uh, what is a uh, label generation rule uh, set for root zone but the label generation rule sets are not only needed for root zones also for other nodes down uh, down the tree uh, so uh, the communities actually come together through uh, a middle uh, actually a strategic group from I I can it's called middle east Strat uh, strategy working group um, and uh, it's actually formulated a dedicated task force to not only look at I uh, LGRs but actually look at epic script IDNs holistically in, uh, in, in larger context 
uh, LGR is, is uh, root zone LGR is obviously the first thing which this task force is going to take up. Uh, but it will, as I said, is not going to take this up in isolation. It's going to look at Arabic uh, domain labels for uh, in, uh, in other contexts as well. For example, second level LGRs, uh, universal acceptability of Arabic ID and so on. So it's going to take up many more things. Um, just to give you a little more introduction of this task force, uh, its, uh, its membership is open, it's community based. Uh, there was actually a public call uh, done for it uh, in August and September time. Uh, applications were received, everybody who had applied was incorporated in the task force. It's a rolling process, it's not something which was closed in September. Um, to ensure, uh, so the task force was formally announced at the Arabic IGF 2 in Algeria recently. Um, uh, we actually been uh, making sure that uh, there is diversity in this task force. So currently we have 20 members and 50 from 50 different countries. We started at uh, about uh, uh, 7, 15 members from about 12 countries, uh, but we uh, were missing some significant representation from languages which are not uh, covered. Uh, so we've actually been able to we've we've gone out out to people who actually work with those languages, invited them to join the task force and brought them on board. So now actually the task force covers a reasonable variety of languages which include uh, uh, languages across Southeast Asia, South Asia, North, Middle East and North Africa and some some other countries. Here. Thank you. Next we'll have Akshat, President of Dev Nagari. through which the Devanagari uh, case study went. Uh, before I uh, start with this, I would just like to give you an uh, overview of my organization, that is uh, SIDAC. Uh, we are based in India and we are uh, working on uh, multilingual computing. Uh, most of the uh, operations are based on natural language processing. Uh, and why we are working on IDNs is, uh, we had initially been working on the uh, Indian uh, IDNs uh, under .incctld. Uh, we have been closely working with uh, Nixie, uh, that is the parent organization for the .incctld. Uh, we are planning to uh, launch IDNs uh, in uh, .in and uh, we had done fairly uh, good amount of groundwork for that. Uh, there were some of the issues that were uh, that came up when we uh, thought about launching IDNs uh, in Indian languages and subsequently even when the, as the new GTLD program launched, uh, the need for identification of issues uh, for Indian languages was filled by ICANN as well and then this project uh, started. So uh, that's a bit of a background. I have just uh, roughly uh, divided this presentation into four parts. Uh, initially it will be overview, then we go into the issues, uh, solutions and some of the probable resolutions which will take to the uh, final uh, routes on NGR uh, for the Devanagari. So uh, Devanagari script, uh, it is basically an alpha syllabary, uh, which means uh, it has alphabets and uh, syllables. Uh, the main uh, components of the writing system are consonants, uh, which are standalone stand consonants. Uh, then there are vowels which are accompanied by associated uh, diacritic marks. Uh, so uh, I'll just give you, uh, this, this image over here uh, just gives a uh, glimpse of what are the various possible combinations that can be done with a root character. Uh, I'll just try to uh, elaborate a bit on this. Uh, this, the highlighted part, this is the base, char base character and whatever is surrounding that, and these are the various characters which can be associated with this base character form multiple shapes. 
okay uh, this is devanagari script uh, as a representative and uh, uh, here are other script like this is bangla and uh, most of the other scripts uh, these all uh, scripts uh, basically have a, a same uh, parent script that is brahmi uh, the founding uh, principles of these scripts are uh, almost similar even though visually they are a bit uh, different Uh, so when the project started uh, there was a discussion regarding whether we should only go for devanagari or there are some associated uh, scripts uh, but then it was uh, thought of that we'll start with devanagari and since devanagari uh, has the same structural similarities with other uh, brahmi based uh, scripts uh, most of the solutions and issues that would be found would be applicable equally to the other scripts as well Uh, entering into the issues part uh, i'll just try to uh, stress upon the point of why visual similarities uh, a big concern for uh, devanagari uh, script uh, going by the numbers uh, devanagari typically has 37 consonants which are in general use uh, 15 vowels which combine with the consonants and 14 vowel signs uh, there is just a bit of math over there uh, that says that uh, with these many characters uh, we have Uh, 1651 uh, basic shapes uh, which a, a normal user can understand uh, and uh, then there is an, another uh, concept of conjunct where two uh, base consonants join with each, with each other to form a different uh, combination visual combination uh, if we add up that uh, thing here what we end up actually is in 57000 different shapes which a user can understand uh, not all 57000 are in use but uh, if we go by the general whatever whatever is the general uh, usage it, it still stands at uh, 25000 unique shapes uh, a regular font uh, has 500 uh, uh, basic glyphs out of which the characters are composed and uh, then there are even more complex uh, levels at that i'll not even uh, go into that level but uh, uh, these are Uh, the number of shapes, shapes that are uh, possible in devanagari languages and with these many shapes uh, the visual similarity uh, definitely uh, becomes a prime concern uh, apart from visual uh, uh, thing there are uh, phonetic variants uh, in devanagari based languages so uh, the example over here is uh, the word hindi writ uh, written uh, in two different forms it's just that uh, it has a different storage but pronounce while pronouncing it is the same for everybody uh, there are additionally linguistically cognate variants as well so uh, with, uh, uh, recently mumbai uh, bombay has changed its name from bombay to mumbai so uh, for many people uh, even uh, this is a kind of variant when it doesn't matter where they are talking uh, in terms of bombay or mumbai they are talking about the same city and they know it so uh, for them it's not uh, much of a different thing uh, but whatever is the what is the ground situation uh, when it comes to devanagari script uh, it is uh, since it is a complex script uh, there are many actors into play when these uh, scripts are uh, represented uh, in the digital medium and uh, some of the prime actors here are the uh, internet browsers and the operating systems uh, for all this jugglery to happen uh, it is not as same as uh, latin script uh there is an additional component that operating system it inserts into the uh, system that is rendering engine and it varies from each operating system to operating system that amounts to the uh, differences in visual appearance of the characters coming to the solutions part uh, th this was one of the founding uh, fun, uh, founding pr uh, principles that uh, whatever is the uh, solution that would be proposed it has to be uh, the the decision has to be definitive non disputed and uh, it has to be programmatically implementable uh, this is because the way domain registration works it's an automated system and we cannot uh, have a manual intervention into it uh, ground reality is uh, about the kinds of variants that uh, uh, we have is phonetic variants uh, those are not definitive uh, because the dialect changes so uh, phonetic variants change for people so uh, those cannot be definitive cognate variants also uh, some may say that mumbai and bombay are two different uh, strings uh, whereas it may not make any difference for uh, someone else visual variants yes they are uh, uh, something which can be handled programmatically but then it calls for another uh, thing to be resolved and uh, that is achieved through a term known as full level evaluation rules i'll just try to touch upon that in the in my last slide 
So, uh, what ultimately uh, the resolution boiled down to, yeah, it was that we can do uh, visual vari uh, variants and they, they can be accommodated into this process. Uh, uh, but one of the uh, key things that was discussed uh, when we were discussing uh, the Unagri visual variants was that there is an already existing ICANN process uh, which deals with the visual similarity. Uh, whenever a string is uh, delegated, uh, there is a, a string similarity uh, tool that is run, uh, which gives the similar uh, look and feel of the already existing TLDs. So, uh, a, a primary thought is that uh, if something needs to be added, it can be added uh, to enhance that process. Where, but that this visual similarity analysis calls for a, a given that is, uh, there are certain ways in which these languages are represented and if somebody wants to create something which looks similar to an already existing thing uh, that can be generated out if it is uh, not a valid construct. So uh, having a valid construct for a top level domain in uh, Devanagari based languages is uh, definitely needed and that will be achieved uh, through this whole level ev evaluation rules for Devanagari. I have just given an uh, example like uh, the second word is uh, not well formed even the th uh, third one is whenever uh, there would be some kind of validation that would be performed on these uh, labels and only those will pass the system which are uh, valid as per the whole label evaluation rules. So uh, these are uh, two things that we have discussed and agreed upon uh, that may uh, happen. Ultimately the decision will be uh, taken when the community comes together and they discuss what are the possible uh, solutions uh, but uh, I think this should be uh, sufficient for the Thank you, Akshat. Um, I forgot to introduce him again. I forgot to introduce quite a few of the, the panelists. Akshat uh, Joshi is project engineer from the Center for Development of Advanced Computing in India, where I can just uh, establish a center of excellence for the DNS uh, security. Yes, congratulations. Uh, next is Edmund. Are you uh, Edmund Chung is CEO of Dot Asia and Vice Chair of Internet Society Hong Kong. Thank you, Renalia. And as I bring up Um, as Rinaldi mentioned, I'll talk a little bit about the experience from the uh, Chinese community, uh, especially on the, uh, I guess, uh, driving the development on the Han script uh, IDNs. So I thought I would start off with, with talk about, you know, what, what is an IDN variant? And in fact, you know, to, unfortunately to, to disappoint you, uh, one of the things that the community has really found out is that it's, it's sort of an elusive uh, thing. So, um, in, in the true spirit of the internet and uh, this multi-stakeholder approach uh, that we talked about, this is kind of a, you know, we, we're not achieving full agreement on what an ID and variant is, but uh, if we can have enough agreement to, to, to work towards, uh, you know, to, to work together, that's, that's really what it is. But um, I still want to um, see at least some uh, new faces around. This is kind of the worst but um, easiest to understand uh, way to talk about uh, ID invariants, I guess, is that, you know, imagine that there, you know, the, the uh, capital letters and, and small letters are uh, technically different on the uh, DNS. Uh, we might need to have policies to uh, make them the same in a way. So this is a situation with uh, simplified and traditional Chinese where, where we uh, identified the, the issue. Uh, again, don't take that analogy too far because it will break down you know, a lot of ways, but that's the easy way to understand. So what they are, uh, I guess the way to summarize that, these are things that have linguistic origins. Um, there, are, there are different characters that are being used. And then because of te certain technical limitations of the DNS and of you know, how, how we use the DNS, um, there are policy implementations that are required to implement uh, ID invariants so that it, it is uh, better uh, used by uh, internet users uh, when, when they use the Chinese domain name, for example. So uh, Hong already mentioned about the CDNC, that's the Chinese Domain Name Consortium that was formed in 2000. Um, 
uh, and a couple of uh, uh, IETF RFCs were uh, were 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 created um, from the work uh, and along with uh, other people as well. Uh, one is called the JET Guidelines for IDN and another uh, focused more on Chinese uh, domain names. And another thing uh, that is of, of importance, I guess, is uh, a couple of IANA IDN tables were, were submitted by uh, CNNIC and TWNIC uh, respectively. And um, uh, a a couple of years ago, uh, Dot Asia uh, ourselves also submitted a, a table that essentially put together the uh, CN table and TW table, uh, and here is why. And I explain it uh, because it's very relevant for uh, our discussion at the root, which uh, which uh, Andrew mentioned. So, um, as a basic, um, the the policy is that you know if you apply for a, a simplified Chinese. Uh, string or a domain name, you would uh, get the traditional Chinese uh, string as well uh, as a variant, and you would have reserved other types of uh, uh, strings that are basically generated from the table. The challenge then uh, for uh, for ap uh, operating as a GTLD uh, versus CCTLD is that um, in in the CN, uh, TW, and, and actually in this case also J Japanese uh, tables. They have a context uh, based on the TLD, uh, CCTLD, like .jp. You would, you know, expect that, that that's Japanese. .cn. You would expect that that's Chinese. Uh, in the case of .asia, or in the case of GTLDs, or if you think about it, in the case of the root, there is no such context, and therefore additional uh, 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 considerations need to be made. And such considerations need to be made both on uh, utilizing uh, simplified Chinese together with traditional Chinese, as well as the overlap with uh, Japanese kanji characters. So here's just a quick example of one of the characters, um, which is somewhat uh, um, interesting. And this is a character that mean, can mean hair or, or development. Um, and there's also a, a Japanese kanji character that is related to the set of uh, Chinese uh, characters and these are this is some of the issue one of the issues or, or actually one of the main issues uh, that the when when we talk about uh, the uh, uh, I guess Han script or Han characters that are being used in the IDN uh, in, the, in the root or in the, in the GTLD context we, we will probably need to consider uh, the simplified Chinese uh, uh, context traditional Chinese context as well as uh, Japanese kanji uh, context. And although I, you know, um, talk about this uh, as if there's a lot of problems, I think the the community has spent the last uh, uh, 13, 14 years working working out the the solutions, and I'm I, I'm glad to, uh, well, at least I'm hopeful to say that uh, we're quite confident that that we have a pretty solid um, uh, solution set based on policy implementation for uh, ID and variants. But uh, that being said. Um, Actually, just before that, one of the uh, things that I want to, did want to bring out as well is that you, you heard about Chinese, uh, both simplified and traditional, and you heard about uh, Japanese kanji. One uh, uh, somewhat popularly used uh, uh, Han character uh, usage uh, in Korea, which is Korean hanja, uh, is not discussed. And that's because um, there is a very strong consensus in the uh, community from from Korea that Korean hanja uh, will not be used, uh, will not be allowed for registration in uh, Korean IDN context, and therefore they're not uh, included. So, uh, as a summary, the, the Han character IDNs uh, really we're, we're talking about you know when we talk about in the GTLD context, and you know that I guess that relates to the uh, root context as well. Um, we're talking about the, the sort of intersec uh, or intersection or union of, of simplified Chinese, traditional Chinese, and Japanese uh, kanji characters, and, and that brings me to I think what's something that's that's even more important I, I think uh, for for this uh, this program as well, which is the uh, user experience, because ultimately um, the ID variants are implemented, the policies are implemented to enhance the user experience. However, there are certain challenges. Uh, internet users, registrants, registrars, uh, hosts, you know, how, how, how do they deal with the different uh, variants uh, that are essentially distinct uh, DNS entries, but uh, how do they host it so that, you know, it's considered the same uh, domain by, by policy or by, you know, uh, somewhat 
by, with the same applicant, uh, with the same registrant. How do registrars and registries handle it? And with that, actually, it relates very much to a, a problem uh, which generally called the universal acceptance of TLDs or universal acceptance of ID and TLDs uh, in, that, uh, in this uh, context. So there are similar problems, uh, similar points of failures um, uh, where ISPs, hosts uh, might, might choke on, on IDN or IDN variants or IDN TLDs. Um, there, is, there is also an interesting common interest that is now being built between the uh, CCTLDs and the GTLDs, the country code top level domains, and the generic top level domains. And I guess the, the, the key uh, message that I want to bring forward is that this, this really requires industry-wide uh, collaboration, and it's not just a, it's not just an ICANN issue, uh, and uh, it is the the whole uh, user community and the technical community issue. So, really, what we're talking about is that a lot of times um, interfaces or or, or um, applications they have uh, preset certain uh, list of TLDs. Uh, here, you say see a drop down box, and if a new top of domain or a new G, uh, uh, IDN top of domain is added that field needs to be compatible. Another type of scenario, uh, if you try to sign on to a, uh, a social network, for example, your email address or your uh, URL, um, will that database accept uh, IDNs? Um, there's also the search engines, um, and search engines are, have different components, the search results, the, uh, the advertising results, and you know, some other uh, results. Uh, will they uh, accept IDNs, uh, especially variants? IDN variants as well. Uh, how do they relate? Emails, of course. That's uh, that's uh, one of the uh, top usage for domain names as well. Um, and how would they? How would email clients uh, uh, react? So, why are they not accepted? There are a number of reasons why. Of course, uh, a lot of them are, uh, uh, is based on in technical uh, origins. Um, one of the reasons uh, that, that we found is that a lot of applications or interfaces utilize uh, hard-coded lists, uh, and they're not easily updated. They might use uh, different uh, uh, lists that are out there that is not fully uh, synchronized with the ICANN route, uh, the single route that um, uh, Andrew mentioned about as well. And there are certain applications that check the length of the string. So, um, you know, applications expect that top-level domains are either two characters or three characters long. But with an IDN, uh, because of the uh, punicode, uh, because of the, the, the technical implementation, it would be much longer. Uh, so how would these uh, uh, play? And, of course, there are other uh, uh, sort of gatekeepers as well, like spam filters, like uh, invalid uh, email addresses or invalid uh, domain names, uh, systems that are out there that would need to know about uh, IDNs that we need to know about IDN variants as well. So uh, with that, what, what has been done? The, um, actually, the uh, ICANN SSAC, uh, this is not, a, not an entirely new issue. It's an issue that has been anticipated for a long time. Um, when, when new GTLDs were introduced itself, uh, info and .museum, uh, this, some of these this issues were, were surfaced, and the SSAC came out with a report um, uh, with a number of recommendations, ICANN has implemented a, a number of them. Not all of them has been uh, implemented. A couple of them that, that has been uh, implemented, including a, a TLD verification code that uh, ICANN has produced, and you know, hopefully uh, more people would be using it. Um, there is also a draft set of outreach materials that, that are, are being, you know, being uh, developed. Um, and finally, um, a, a joint working group between the CCNSO and GNSO is putting out a number of recommendations um, to, and hopefully this will be, uh, the, the process will be completed and the two councils would be uh, presenting this, this, these set of recommendations to, uh, back to the board, uh, ICANN board. But one of the key uh, uh, recommendations there is to um, at least get, get our own act together because uh, what is interesting is that you know, look at some of the registries and registrars who offer uh, IDN TLDs they themselves uh, have uh, their own systems may not be fully compliant or may not be fully embracing uh, IDN TLDs or uh, especially IDN variants uh, in, in, in like uh, email addresses or like name server uh, records for uh, domain names. So this is an issue, um, uh, both the acceptance of IDN TLDs and the acceptance of, especially the acceptance of IDN variant TLDs or IDN variants in general uh, this is an issue 
that will, uh, you know, unless we address it as a, as a whole, um, will continue and will be amplified, especially when we see uh, IDN CCTLDs uh, uh, being implemented now. And also, of course, uh, we've recently heard that, know that uh, IDN GTLDs are also uh, being implemented into the route. So uh, with that, thank you. Thank you, Edmund. I think it would be fair to say that universal acceptance is probably the highest on the end user community agenda in terms of problem. So I'd like to go around the room and see if there are any questions or concerns. And I know we're running out of time, but I will take a little bit more of the time. Any questions? Your hand up? Okay, I see Olivier and then him. Uh, thanks very much, Renaldi. Olivier Kapan and Bill, the elect chair. But I'll, I'll ask this question to the individual. Um, We've just spoken about universal acceptance and uh, user ability, uh, usability by the user community. Uh, what's the status with regards to the actual applications running um, uh, and their ability to use those uh, ITMs? Uh, email, uh, web browsers, uh, etc. I know some perform some verification and then some might cough or, or might not cough anymore. Uh, is there any status on this as well? Um, for the remote participants, this is Andrew. Uh, I, um, the, the short answer is that on the internet, um, because it's a permissionless system, right, there's end to end, um, uh, the, the, the innovation is really at the edges. Uh, it, it's, it's very difficult to guarantee universal acceptance of anything. Um, what we do know is that um, we, we went through a round of this back in 2001 when we added some, some top level labels that were longer than traditionally and uh, they haven't they haven't worked um, consistently everywhere some of them still to this day so so I think we should expect that there are going to be some barriers and I think that we should expect that there's going to be some difficulty not because they won't work in the DNS but because they won't work in certain applications or something like that and, and really there's nothing we can do about that except to encourage people not to not to do that. Now, I will say that there are there is some technical uh, work going on to try to discourage some of the systems that have have traditionally been used in order to do this, including uh, some work um, just to do my own part, uh, some work that I've trying to be uh, trying trying to try to push through the ITF in order to suggest a new way of, of tracking, you know, what is a legitimate top level label and what is not. Thank you, Andrew. I think Ram also wants to respond to that question. Go ahead, Ram. Uh, Ramali, this is Ram. Uh, it was only at the very end, just a wrap up, uh, not a question itself. So I'm happy to wait. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Hero, you had a question. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, this is Hero from JD. Uh, I have a question about the requirement to the variants. Uh, so this session, I think, is mainly focused on the definition of idea variants. On, on top of that, there should be some requirements such as, uh, as Andrew said, allowing the location of some variants vari vari to the same applicant. So uh, it's related to the last part of uh, Edmond's presentation, what, what already may be touched on Edmond's presentation in a way. But on top of that, there may need of some requirement, or is there any possible further requirements for the resolution of the variants of the domain name, such as variants of a domain name should be resolved to the same IP address, which may be good from the aspect of user experience. For this kind of topics discussed, well, may maybe I'm wrong, but Universal acceptance seems to be now focused on the unique user experience across TLD. But how about the user experience among variants? Yeah, uh, thank you, this is Edmund here. Um, I think if I got your uh, question correctly, you're talking about a, a potential um, uh, discussion about a requirement for uh, handling ID invariants and how it's put into the DNS. Um, the current, at least my current thinking, or at least the uh, the Chinese experience, is to say that 
um, at, on a registry point of view um, to allocate it to the same applicant and also to delegate to the same set of name servers. Um, as to the IP address that is being used, uh, if you're talking about a, an end resource like a website or, or a web uh, a resource, uh, I personally think that that might not be uh, what, uh, at least at the ICANN level, the registry level, we should be uh, uh, regulating or, or trying to uh, at least uh, um, make a definitive uh, coordination. I think if we allocate it to the same applicant and allocate, delegate to the same set of name servers, that uh, that should provide the uh, enough kind of a, a package for uh, users and, and registrants as well. I put, put out an example, like for example, in simplified Chinese and traditional Chinese, it is quite possible. In fact, we are seeing that happen. Is that the uh, the, the, the registrant um, for a domain name would set the uh, simplified Chinese to to name uh, to web servers in in China. That the traditional Chinese uh, to web servers in 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 Hong Kong or Taiwan. So so the end record, the IP address of the uh, resource uh, may not be the same, but the set of name servers and the uh, registrant uh, should be the same. Thank you, Edmund. I think Ram wants to respond to Hero's question. Is that correct, Maureen? Go ahead, Ram. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think this is uh, an area where one size does not fit all. Um, depending on the locale, depending on the registry, and most importantly, depending on the user community, um, the the decision needs to be made as to whether variants uh, should point to the same place or to other places. Uh, so, in general, I agree with, with Edmund that uh, it's not an area for regulation. But at the same time, um, I think it's important to, to note the distinction that within a registry, it might be very useful to have consistency of a policy about what happens to variants. But across registries, there probably ought to be a space for variation depending on locale, community, uh, and type of TLD. You happy with that response here? Okay, thank you. Any other questions around the table? You have another question? I'll look on this side first to see if there's anyone else. No, go ahead, Olivier. Thanks very much, Renatia. It's Olivier Klepp on the blog. We spoke earlier about the uh, task forces uh, that are currently looking at the variants. Um, I understand that the, the, the Chinese one has uh, pretty much uh, reached the end of its work or, or is reaching. Okay. There might not be an end to its work. Okay, there's the ongoing work in the in the Chinese one. There's an Arabic one which has has started. Is there a calendar of the start of other task forces with regards to other scripts as well? So Olivier, we just uh, talked about that. We've opened. We we made a call for uh, application from the panels that are going to form the LGRs for each script, and uh, that just happened in July. So uh, we received a few, we expect the first panel before, before the end of this year, uh, and so uh, we expect uh, about 17 scripts that will participate, so we're waiting for that to happen, so it's just happening now. Well, so Edmund, just to clarify, um, I think, uh, Olivia, you, you're asking, that there has been a lot of uh, community work done, you know, in different communities, and Chinese started way a long time ago, uh, but the LGR process in Route, that is just beginning, and so each of those panels are just being being formed. So none of them, I, I don't think any of them have been formed yet. So so it will be formed, uh, and but but the work will not be wasted. I mean, it will work from the community from from a long time could be utilized and, and hopefully quickly uh, come to conclusion with those panels. Uh, this is Andrew Sullivan again. Uh, a key. Uh, piece of this though, and I just wanted to emphasize this because I don't think I made it very clear earlier. Uh, a key part of the design and part of the reason that there's this complicated two-phase uh, sort of commit procedure is is that the the integration panel can actually start um, producing label generation rules before all of the characters in the world have been considered. So so the part of the point of the design is to make it possible that if, for instance, people of the Chinese community and the Arabic community and 
well, maybe just those two, are ready, and nobody else has done any work yet. Uh, you know, everybody in the world doesn't have to wait until all of the languages in the world have been solved. Uh, because the truth of the matter is, we know that there are some languages um, that are active in the world and that are encoded in Unicode, there are writing systems encoded in Unicode, for whom there are, you know, no speakers on the internet and they don't care about those labels. And they're not going to be, they're not going to show up. So, so we wanted to have a system that allowed that. You have a follow-up question, Olivier. <laughs> go ahead. Thanks, Renalia. It's very short. Who to contact or where to go if you want to get involved? There's a lot of people out there that have no idea, but they know that something's happening, and, and I think it'd be really good to make it clear how, what's their first part of contact. So uh, the, the, uh, the team uh, in charge of that in ICANN staff is uh, Nayela and Nicoletta, I think, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, they are available to facilitate this, uh, but uh, there is a lot of information online on the ICANN.org uh, website. Any other questions around table? Before we go, Andrew, can you clarify, because some people have commented on it, there seems to be the lack of an appeal process. For example, when a generation panel submits a proposal, it is rejected by the integration panel, and the integration panel provides an explanation, and somehow the community is not happy, what is the recourse? Um, so there are three things to say about that. The first thing is, um, this is actually an expression of the conservatism principle. So the whole point of having this integration panel and its, and its unanimity provision is exactly that um, uh, there is this conservatism principle, and so if you have people who have doubts and they're presumably, um, uh, you know, widely regarded um, experts, not just friendly people, then um, uh, then they're in a position to say, you know, there's this problem, and the conservatism principle says if people think there's a problem, we can't go ahead. So that's the reason for it. Uh, you're right that there's not an appeal process, but there is, in fact, a sort of you know endless um, uh, loop that can that can go there, uh, right? So so the uh, there there is intended to be actually public negotiation of this, and this is the reason that it depends on on the uh, public comment period and so on, because the integration panel doesn't just get to say no, go away. They have to defend themselves in public, and if they can't defend themselves, then at, at some point, the integration panel is illegitimate, and the answer is, well, you fire the integration panel. Um, so, so the idea is really genuinely that this be a multi-stakeholder process that is held in public and is open and transparent. And if openness and transparency doesn't solve our problem for the operation of the root zone, uh, then we don't have a recourse. We're, we're out of luck at that point. And I think that that's actually just the truth about about this. There is no way that we can come along and say, no, no, we're gonna we're gonna you know cut the baby in half and make the de make the decision. You don't get to do that. So, so unfortunately, uh, you know, that's not a very satisfying answer. Of course, we would like to have an appeals process. But my feeling um, uh, when I was working on this, because I remember having discussions about this at the time, my feeling always was, as soon as I as soon as we invent a, an appeals process, the next stage would be to invent an appeals process for the appeals process. And, you know, eventually we'd get to the turtles all the way down. So I thought, well, we could, we could stop at the first turtle. Thank you. We've come to the end of our session, and Ram would like to wrap the session up. Go ahead, Ram. Thank you. While many impediments remain in the local languages as the natural home of the system, the need for the full expression of human kinds, language systems, and the Internet domain name system is critical. This is important work, but it's also complex work, as you saw from the panelists. So therefore, we should expect this work will take some time to come to fruition. But of the very large number of things that organizations ought to do that are in the public interest, nothing else feels as important as the enablement of languages in the development system. After all, what is more natural? And being able to express yourself in your own language and in your own script. So, Renalia, thank you for putting this together, and I hope that the session has been of value for everybody. Thank you, Ram. Please join me in thanking the panelists and also for your patience in joining us today.